Okay. Uh, thank you for coming back for this session. And as, I'm, as long as I step on here, I realized I have a very strong challenge. Um, especially, this is a session immediately after lunch, and we already had a very intensive discussion for the whole morning, and then after, uh, followed by a very dynamic discussion on the geopolitics around the um, territory issues. So we need to find some way to revive up our spirits and also get the, <laughs> the atmosphere going on again. And by the way, um, my name is Wang Tao, uh, the resident scholar and the Tsinghua Carnegie Center for Global Policy, which is a joint uh, research venture between the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Tsinghua University. It was established in 2010, April 2010, and we have now uh, eight scholars based in Beijing uh, doing research on various areas, and I'm the researchers on the climate and energy policies. Um, so to many of you, whenever you have a next chance to be in Beijing, uh, I will encourage you to say hi and knock on my door, and I would be very welcome to have a chat with you. Um, with that, I think I have very honored to introduce our great panelists, and including two speakers that I, speaking off record, that I think probably the most uh, uh, influential speakers in our panel today, because both of them are Nobel Prize laureates. Um, the first one is Ke uh, Cassie DeLotta, uh, Director of East Asian Affairs of U.S. Department of Energy. And Cassie is currently uh, oversees the collaborations uh, with Japan, China, and Korea, and Mongolia. And before, she also held positions as senior policy advisor in the Department of Treasury and also the UN Climate Negotiation and the U.S.-China 10 Years Framework for Energy and Environment Collaborations under Secretary of Paulson. So she is very experienced and welcome, you see. The second is Director Zhou Dadi, uh, Emeritus uh, Director General of the Energy Research Institute of the National uh, Depart Development and Reform Commissions. And I remember this morning when Kevin introduced uh, Dr. Yang Fuqiang, he said he's the person after Dr. Yang said, everyone seems to be agree with him. And I think, and I believe Dr. Zhou would be the exception. And, and he is, if not more, but at least uh, as influential in the Chinese policy, uh, energy uh, policies in, uh, as Dr. Yang. And we look very much to hear um, his insightful observations. And uh, Dr. Zhou is now a counselor of the State Council, vice chairman of the State Expert Advisory Committee to the National Energy Leading Groups to China, and a vice chairman of China Energy Research Society. And before that, he served as director general for the Energy Research Institute of NDRC for eight years, and also the chief scientist for the expert team of China and the lead author of the uh, IPCC report. And for that contribution, he was also awarded uh, the 2007 Climate Protection Award of the U.S. EP EPA, which is exceptional for a Chinese scientist. And with these two very strong speakers, we also have two very experienced comments, uh, commentators for their, for their talk. The first is Michael Reid. He's the director of Emerging Technologies of Duke Energy. And Michael has 20 years of progressive pro professional experience in regulated electric utility, ut utilities, uh, automobile and cons uh, consultancies. And before that, uh, Reid also works with the Progress Energy um, as the Director of Environmental Sci uh, Services. The last but not least is uh, Dr. Zhou Nan, uh, which is now the Deputy Director of China Energy Group of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and also the Director of U.S.-China Clean Energy Center, which focuses on the building of energy efficiency established between uh, the agreement established by Pre President Obama and Hu Jintao two years ago. And she used to be the assistant professors in two Japanese universities, so I assume you also speak in Japanese as well. Uh, with that, I think we have very good teams for this discussion, and without further ado, let's uh, please join me to welcome our first speaker, Cassie. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Dr. Casey DeLotel, and I'm a, the Director of East Asian Affairs at Department of Energy. Um, my office basically coordinates across uh, DOE. Uh, we have a lot of different types of programs, including nonproliferation, coal, uh, renewable energy, um, and we have a very long-standing history with China. So there's a lot of things that I could be talking about, but I'm going to very briefly give you a history of some of our work on coal, 
And then I wanted to talk more broadly about some of the, the opportunities of working with China, uh, specifically in coal, as well as some of the barriers and how DOE is working on uh, mitigating some of those barriers. So first, just a brief overview of DOE's fossil energy program with China. Uh, it began under the s and agreement in the mid-'80s. We started working on R&D on coal-powered plants with the Chinese very early on. Uh, this was right before China became a net importer of fossil energy, and it was very important to help them, uh, at the time, help them uh, actually look at their efficiency of their coal plants, help them develop the technology. As the relationship has developed, they're now very much more of a partner. So when we work with the National Energy Administration, when we work with NDRC, we consider them an equal partner, and they actually work with us as much as we work with them, and it's jointly funded, and we find it very beneficial in the U.S. as well as helping China. So moving forward to 2009, uh, and even in even in 2008, under Secretary Paulson's 10-year uh, framework, we started looking more at the climate issues. And so how do you make coal not only more efficient, but how do you do clean coal? How do you capture carbon from a coal plant and sequester it or use it? Uh, we've been very active in this area under our flagship uh, partnership called the Clean Energy Research Center. We have a very active coal program. It's joint R&D, jointly funded by the U.S. government and, and uh, not only most, but NEA. And it's look, really looking at carbon capture and utilization options. And we've made actually some very good progress in this area. Uh, particularly Duke and uh, their partners, Huanung, have been looking at the carbon capture plant in Shanghai and looking at the efficiencies and whether or not it can be replicated uh, in the U.S. So that's kind of a brief overview of what we're doing on coal. Um, but I, I really want to focus the talk more on some of the reasons why we work with China. So I get a lot of questions. You know, you read the newspaper, China and the U.S. don't get along in this area and they don't get along in this area. And so I get you know, why are we working with China? Why is it so important that DOE work with our counterparts in China? And I wanted to give basically five reasons. Um, the first, and these are not in any particular order of priority, but the first is to manage global issues. If you're looking at climate change, if you're looking at nuclear proliferation, if you're looking at, at energy security, China and the U.S. play a huge role in global issues. And if we're working together, we can solve these issues. If we're working at opposite ends, we're not going to be able to do that. The second reason is to promote commercial interests in China and conversely promote Chinese interest in the U.S. We both have a role to play in our, each other's markets, whether it's Chinese investment in our energy sector or U.S. investment in the Chinese ener energy sector. We have comparative advantages, uh, whether it's capital, technology, where we are in development, how fast we're building out. We actually have a mutual benefit in investing in each other's infrastructure. We also want to take advantage of the Chinese ramping up their energy sector. And what I mean by that is if you're deploying new technologies, you first have to demonstrate them. The U.S. sector is growing much slower than the Chinese sector. If you really want to get new technologies out there, if you want to demonstrate that they work, if you want to deploy them quickly, working with the Chinese in their energy sector helps you do that. So whether it's a Chinese company or a U.S. company with an innovative idea, using the Chinese ramp up in their energy sector is very useful in deploying new technologies. Clean, you know, clean energy technologies are critical for climate change. Most of these energy technologies are going to be in place 30 to 40 years. Doing this now in China is very important. Promote knowledge and technical innovations that benefit both the U.S. and China through collaborative research. I mentioned our flagship program with China, the Clean Energy Research Center. We see this as a way to leverage not only scientists in both countries, but also the money in both countries to solve the problems we both face. It doesn't do us any good to have scientists over in the U.S. and scientists over in China who are not talking to each other, who are using the same amount of money and coming up with the same solutions. If we combine the money, if we combine the scientists, we can get further faster. And lastly, keep 
the channels of open communication on energy issues. The relationship building that comes from working on these technical issues builds a relationship so when we do have a, a big issue, we have the communication channels to talk about it. When Fukushima happened in Japan and China wanted to review their nuclear power plants, they asked DOE to help them. They know we have the capability to do the simulations and the modeling. Vice versa, when there's an oil shock and China wants to talk to the U.S. about how to mitigate that, they have an open communication channel to us. It's very beneficial for both countries to have this relationship and based on trust and based on uh, uh, just working together on a day-to-day -day basis. So those are all very good reasons for us to do this. Um, so what are the barriers to doing this? If you've read the newspapers, you've read about the trade cases, you've read about the IP issues, uh, DOE does receive a lot of pressure because of these cases, particularly when they're about solar or when they're about wind turbines. So basically our, our biggest barriers to working with China are not kind of the typical, um, you know, which ministry does what, who has responsibility, but actually the political pressure from outside whether it's market access or IP issues or the cyber issues, we get pressure uh, from the interagency as well as the public when we are working with China. Now, never mind, our programs do not actually get directly involved in renewables and we don't get directly uh, involved in the cyber. Uh, we, that pressure still exists. So what DOE has tried to do to help mitigate some of that is in our major programs, we have worked with our partners, and we have uh, put in place uh, public-private partnerships in almost all of our big initiatives. So with the private sector involved, we can help discuss market access issues. And when I say private sector, I'm not talking just about the U.S. private sector. Chinese companies have the same interests as some of the, the U.S. companies. They want to see their IP protected. They want to see market access for their companies in the U.S. So when we bring together the private sector of both countries into these programs, we have a way to talk about market access issues. We have a way to plan around some of the tricky um, uh, trade-related, actually potential trade-related issues. Uh, with the CERC, we were able to even negotiate an IP agreement that worked for our private sector companies. Uh, and Again, I want to emphasize the Chinese companies were asking for this IP agreement as strongly as the U.S. companies. So building these relationships, being able to talk about these, these political pressure from the outside, we were able to have a really solid uh, foundation for our, our cooperation. So I'll leave it at that because I know uh, uh, I only have a few minutes, but I'm happy to take questions at the end, uh, either about sort of the broader political issues or about coal-specific issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cassie. And uh, I met her uh, the day before yesterday uh, in the DOE, so we already discussed something how to encourage the, the, the future cooperation. So I fully agree with a lot of things you, you already said. Uh, uh, why the cooperation between U.S. and uh, uh, China on the energy uh, is so significant uh, for China, or even for both of us, because I think that we 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 can look at that in the two points of view. One is to avoid the conflict, because uh, for a long time the people have a lot of concern about the energy supply, energy security, energy <laughs> market balance, and so on. And when China came into the market, uh, becomes the importer, and uh, we do have some concern from other countries, including maybe uh, U.S. But the fact is that uh, China is not really destroyed the markets. China contributes to the markets, and uh, uh, every year China contributes more than uh, 250 uh, billion U.S. dollars for the <laughs> oil and the uh, um, petrol and, and the natural gas uh, sectors in the world. So it helps all the world become more, you know, uh, keep a lot of places become more stable. And 
I think the 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 the, the, the capital of the, the energy capital gets a lot from China. I so so it's not really destroy the system; it's improve the system. So uh, the second is I think the cooperation will means to explore a new future because we we face the same challenge, uh, not only for the energy supply themselves, but also mainly the climate change challenge. So. Uh, if we collaborate e each other and uh, we can uh, help uh, both sides and uh, even for the world to solve the problem more smoothly. And uh, if we are not involved and uh, if we cannot cooperate uh, 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 actively, the, 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 the response to the climate change will be slower down. So that's important. And uh, of course, I, I fully agree with the ambassador said, uh, you know, uh, we may have somewhere we we do have some kinds of conflict, or uh, but we we need to explore more place. Then we 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 do have much win-win uh, potential. That is important. So the energy fields and climate fields uh, is uh, the challenge of face of of both. So we can make it as a very important uh, fields to develop the cooperation and the win-win solution. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a fact that uh, uh, from this morning, everyone knows that we are top two energy consumers. Uh, we, both of us, uh, 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 added, we, we consumed over 40% of the total energy of the world as two country, And uh, we are top two uh, greenhouse gas emitters. And maybe the share is similar than with that so the energy shares, uh, and uh, you know we have a very great uh, the impact on the, the world energy markets, technology, and the climate change of the world. So, uh, in most of the cases, so that is uh, increase importance and the significance of our cooperation in the energy fields. Uh, so I think uh, uh, politically and all the Chinese uh, industrial sectors, we really attach importance for the energy cooperation with the U.S. And I believe U.S. Uh, is the same position as uh, Kaz already mentioned. We are trying to promote that. Uh, we have a lot of progress. And uh, some people uh, calculate that uh, they say even more than 200 different kinds of agreements <laughs> or memo are signed between the two countries by different uh, government agencies and uh, uh, official uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, and uh, there are some, it's yes, very important, like the, the U.S.-China framework for the 10-year cooperation on energy and environment. And we have an echo partnership agreement and we already developed the city to city company between companies and universities cooperation on like a clean power generation, electric car, wind power, clean coal, shell gas, and the CCS and other environmental related with uh, energy issues for cooperation. And a lot of projects happened. Uh, and uh, recently, the clean energy programs, including uh, more efforts on the buildings and the renewables. Uh, play a very important role as well. It becomes uh, uh, real things happened for the cooperation uh, besides of a lot of agreements. Uh, and uh, these activities promoted the cooperation on technology development and uh, real business. Uh, so there's uh, achievements. But uh, if we look at the uh, real thing happening in the energy sectors, we, I think the further efforts necessary because uh, although there are many activities, but the big results is uh, rather limited. Uh, why? Uh, China now invested about six trillion US dollars per year as a capital investment. And uh, more than 300 billion US dollars in the energy sectors. Uh, but uh, our cooperation 
I think impact only very few of that, although achievement there, but uh, how to really leverage the activities of the energy sectors. And if you including the energy utilization sectors, that our activities are quite not enough. And the second is the business is very limited. You know, so we have a lot of agreements, uh, some kinds of activities, some cooperation, but uh, the big business, the big cooperative uh, enterprises activities is very few. And uh, once we had some thing like that, for Sinox uh, um, purchase some uh, company assets, then some people will say, oh, yes, dangerous, it's not, we have to check that. So uh, let's put that not as a, you know, willingness, but we have to really, like Ambassador say, that we, we need real bigness, right? Big business is important for the future. Uh, we have to overcome some obstacles for real investment. Uh, the study or cooperative uh, uh, research has not yet got very influential technology as an output. Of course, it needs time. But uh, on the other hand, I think the both sides the input is not enough. It's not becomes the mainstream. It, it becomes uh, some side <laughs> events of the mainstream. But of course, it's, uh, we can improve that. And uh, the cooperative projects as a total has a too small scale compared with the huge capital investment on, on these sectors. And uh, in general, the political process is very long and it take a couple of years and even several years but, uh, before real things started. So we have to shorten that process. And uh, both sides have a different kinds of uh, policy implementing mechanisms in two countries. For example, in China, in general, the policy of government is really related with the company's <laughs> investment is very closely be matched. But uh, uh, we don't know what happens because sometimes uh, American government has said they have no influence on the company, more or less. Or it's very difficult to initiate the government money to really do things with China. So. Sometimes we need to find a way how to <laughs> overcome this concept. Uh, to some extent, it makes the Chinese side always be, you know, un not understanding because we have so many agreements. Finally, uh, it's a difficulties to be implemented uh, somewhere. So <laughs> it becomes uh, next time if we collect a, a company to to work with us, the company say, "Okay, we already talked so long. <laughs> what will happen?" So they are not so. A positive response. That, that's our challenge. You, the the China, Chinese government always faced some time. So we need the, 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 the agreement between us it becomes more effective. So uh, we have to find a way how to, how to overcome this kind of obstacles. And of course, uh, the trust weak, not in the energy fields, but uh, more or less be influenced by other sides. For example, uh, how the science, technology, cooperation, and the collaboration can be pursued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not an energy problem. It's a, more or less, uh, there are more obstacles, I think, in this side, <laughs> in your side, right? So you have a lot of limits. Those kind of things cannot do with China. That kind of thing, China can be involved. This will be limited a lot of new technology development and the cooperative uh, uh, exploration. So... And uh, of course, uh, uh, Casey already mentioned that some kinds of negative rumor as a cyber security complaint. Mm -hmm. But as I know, you know, the no any Chinese any company says they have a cyber arm <laughs> <laughs> to do anything like that. So I, I think is you know if you really want the technology detail how the cyber if there were cyber arm they know the technology. They know what kinds of uh, so-called secrets can be stored. So that's a very, very, you know, to some extent, if you are technical people, you, we, we will not understand why it happened. <laughs> so this is something we have to overcome. 
Uh, and I think that we have to look the future. We need to enhance responsibilities for the world's future, uh, especially the low carbon. A, uh, currently, I think the challenge is not how to keep the balance. It's how to make the energy technology and the energy system of the, our two countries and uh, even to help the whole world to become the low carbon uh, system in the future. So we need to take the lead in this area by the two countries. And uh, of course, we will collaborate with others, not only between us. And uh, we will have to promote real big business and a stronger political willingness to work on this area. So we need more comprehensive and uh, consistent policy to promote cooperation and cooperation in any field. That's, uh, you know, sometimes it's the, I say, the DOE's uh, friend said it's uh, not so, uh, under their control. <laughs> so so I, I think we have to, to find a better environment to, as a comprehensive and harmonize the policy uh, package in both sides. Uh, then I, I would like to say something coal. Coal is uh, both of the challenge and uh, uncertainty because uh, Although we are talking about how to cooperate in the coal, but uh, practically, uh, I am personally puzzled how to really promote the so-called uh, cooperation on coal. Because uh, uh, if you want to use more coal, <laughs> or you want to use less coal, that's, that's a direction different. So we are top two coal consumers. China consumes about 3.5. Uh, uh, 6 billion tons of coal, and the U.S. in general is 1 billion, and uh, now it's a, a little bit less. Uh, in my understanding, China's coal is going to come to the city, will be kept for the coal consumption in the future, near future, and very soon, in my understanding. It's not 10, 20 years after. It could uh, come into the three, five years the cap will be uh, established. And uh, China's coal is already declined. Mm -hmm. So in this case, how can we, we cannot say, okay, because the Chinese, uh, UNES have the spare coal, you, you can export to China. But uh, if China declines the demands, <laughs> what has happened? So <laughs> we have to look at the, the different kinds of forecasting and uh, uh, especially the local the pollution control will be the first priority in China. It will limit the coal consumption in the future very soon. And uh, the Chinese government, based on the situation, already decided to declare the so-called total amount control of the energy consumption by 2015. Uh, 2015. That already limits the total amount of primary energy, and I think the coal will will face the first challenge for, so, for to, to, to increase. So carbon emission will be the biggest challenge for coal future. Uh, so that means clean coal technology, if you don't care the carbon, it would not be clean. If you develop such kinds of so-called clean coal technology, you will face bigger challenge in the future. So we have to combine the, 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 the low carbon coal technology <laughs> if we really say it's clean coal technology. But as in the temporarily, in the short term, to improve the efficiency, to, to, to clean the emission of the traditional pollutants uh, still is important. But if you look at 20 years after, then the technology could be a very short lifetime. So that's uh, the real challenge. So uh, current coal business and trace or yes, our focus point, or we focus on longer term low carbon coal technology or replacements. I think that we need to do better choice from both sides. Uh, I think this needs more study and exchange. So we, we cannot uh, uh, lock in the current so technology to, to make it more detailed. This is a challenge for us. So, but anyway, coal still play important role in, for long. Uh, by 2050, in the most uh, optimal, uh, optimized uh, uh, or optimistic uh, forecast for the uh, low carbon uh, uh, mix of China, yes, uh, China still may use um, one or two billion tons of coal by that time. But it's already half of current uh, <laughs> amounts. And uh, 
uh, many models suggest that CCS has to be uh, used in the uh, uh, near future. So uh, we have to solve what means cleaner utilization technology and measures for the at least 30 years, 20 years, or even longer. Uh, and we have to really look at the CCS and uh, it's not only technology, how the system will work, where you put it, <laughs> right? How, how the pipeline or everything will be set up. It's not 100 million tons, it's uh, several billion tons of carbon dioxide. It's a big system, it's, a, it's not a small text. So, so, so it's a big challenge. Uh, uh, for to some extent, uh, the imports right now for the coal is a supplementary of the coal supply of China, but uh, I don't think it's uh, for longer, because uh, we may have a, you know the surplus of the so-called production supply in the near future. Uh, so the competition will be very serious. Uh, and I hope that the lower coal price will not lead to more carbon emission. Uh, that's my concern. Uh, potential for technology cooperation or collaboration is uh, very wide. You will see the list there. Uh, the coal emission control technology, uh, advanced the coal clean combustion technology, advanced the coal fire power generation uh, technology, and uh, uh, clean coal transform uh, technology. It's already happened somewhere. Uh, electricity transmission, uh, super high voltage transmission, uh, or smart grids that fit to the distributed and the renewables uh, uh, the, the, and combined with how the big coal fire power, power plant can be operated in that case. Uh, we are facing the, already the, the, the problem in China. And uh, so I think the both country, I, I cannot take the time to say where the China is in advance, where is the United States have better technology right now. But uh, my uh, suggestion is uh, the technology is not enough. We have to work harder on this area. And there's some related technology as well, for example, cold massing and the cold gas emission control and utilization because there's a big emission of the greenhouse gas uh, as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll the part my time. Thank you, Dr. Zhou. And I think with this, we have heard the voice from both governments, uh, because both of them can represent actually uh, quite well the thinking of the government. And I think one common uh, phenomenon we can find out is uh, both are calling for the real business engagement and, and action from the private sector. So I think now we are very lucky to have the comments from the private sector. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Michael. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The good news is I do not agree or disagree with any of the comments from the previous two speakers. Um, they did a good job at framing the issues and um, the opportunity is a very high level. Um, I can talk more about the practicalities of trying to collaborate in China. We um, went to China in 2009 with some um, clear goals. The first one was technology very much in line with what Casey said. We wanted to try and bring clean energy technology to the US with lower R&D &D costs. We also wanted to take advantage of scaling technology, um, as mentioned by Casey. Um, we also wanted to leverage resources. We actually wanted access to Chinese capital markets. Now, some people might say we already borrow enough money from China, but I couldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> um, also, uh, we wanted to look at new business opportunities. Um, you know, we want to advance economic development in the U.S. through Chinese investment. Um, before we went to China, we were, I suppose, we had some trepidation about things. And Casey again framed it very well. You know, we were the top concerned by not just coal and really across all industries of the IP issue, but also then just the lack of trust on both sides, and that's just from not knowing each other and having different cultures. Um, and also then knowledge poaching, which is really the IP issue. But also there's a lack of a tested collaboration process. We're, we're not really used to this. We're getting better at it. But if you think about um, 
you know, in the practicality of trying to do it, what we came across was more to do with things like bureaucracy and even the business culture is called Guan Xi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, I'm starting to know what Guan Xi is. We actually have someone in a Beijing office that helps us with our relationship building, and she's Chinese, so she knows what Guan Xi is. Um, communication, the language itself, um, you can imagine uh, the challenges, and I'm just learning those. When I go to China, I speak with a Northern Ireland accent, so that adds further difficulty. Um, <laughs> and just cultural differences. And then the organizational structure. The U.S. organizations now are very um, lean and not very hierarchical, so we kind of delegate a lot. In, in, in China, it's not quite like that, so communication has slowed down, and it maybe impedes um, action plans getting, getting done between the two, com- two organizations. And then just technology... At the moment, um, I say one of our goals was to bring technology over, but I don't know if the U.S. market is quite ready for Chinese technology in many aspects. Um, but I could mention a couple of real roadblocks we ran into, which would probably add some value. Um, there are multiple levels of U.S. regulatory bodies overseeing foreign investment into the U.S. energy market, and they look at the implications across the whole energy value chain, but also the investment aspects themselves. So we actually wanted to do a joint venture um, and build a wind farm in the U.S. and have um, a Chinese partner, and that was turned down. So that was a roadblock. Um, Also what we find is um, just if you work one-on-one in China, we we actually as a utility company have very little to offer and we have technology. We actually want technology. So it's kind of hard to go to China and, and try and get technology if you don't have anything to offer um, especially in the in the coal arena, but in the nuclear arena, it's quite different. We've had a great success, and it's probably worth mentioning because it, it really helps you understand how you might be able to work successfully with coal also. But th- in China, they're building a lot of new nuclear plants, and um, we would like to do that in the U.S., but we're, we're much slower in the process, and we want to build AP1000 units, so China's building those, so we can go over and an exchange, and that's the key, the exchange of, you know, Chinese organizations want something from us that we can give them and vice versa. So we're giving them training and experience of operation of, you know, we've, in the U.S. there's 104 nuclear plants, in China there's 26. So they're very receptive to working with us, and we're going going to get to see the startup of these units in China. So that's probably a good example of how we might work together. Um, but the opportunities are, are, are great, I think. Um, I can talk firsthand about our experiences with the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center. It's been mentioned several times that we're involved. Um, we certainly have a need to solve some very formidable problems, and um, you captured them very well. The technologies that we need to solve, we're, we're not there yet. We really have um, many different problems, really You know, to to cover it well, it's really the efficient extraction of energy and conversion to electricity, and we want to minimize the emissions and CO2. We need a portfolio of capture, utilization, storage options. We need actually to also learn how to have the long-term operations of our existing coal plants. Both China and the U.S. have very similar policies of developing new coal and retiring old ineffective units or inefficient but we really need to think about how we can keep those going. Now that we've invested in scrubbers and SCRs, it seems to make sense to keep those units, which you saw the graph, the capacity additions in the U.S. were mainly in the 70s and the 80s. Those plants were designed for no more than 30 years. But now we've invested a lot of money in those. We need to keep those plants running and then also tee those up for even technology that could capture carbon. And uh, then the water issue is is really coming at us fast, the water energy nexus if we, we refer to it and really today you know our company is certainly very concerned um not just about wastewater treatment itself but also um using less water in the future we see that being added to that you, you saw many charts about all these emissions I mean, all these regulations coming well we feel that that's just going to be added to in the future and it's not going to be less and there's going to be pressure to reduce water so you know just to leave you with one key th- um, aspect to what we find that worked well about Cirque was that although it, it, it took 12 months to get things rolling and that was to do with the IP protection but that really 
I think produced a new way of thinking, produced a kind of a good approach for maybe collaboration in the future. That was that's the number one issue in our industry across every industry. So I think now we we can go past that. And once you get past that, it's a matter of having really a clear shared vision. Um, and if you have that and you have the partners all working towards a common goal that they really want, and we have a common goal, it was up on the chart there, the common goal is, is clean energy. The common goal should also be not to get rid of coal, but to gradually transition into other forms. We want to maintain a balanced portfolio of options. We cannot today, even in my lifetime, think that you know, when I die that there will be no coal. I don't think so, but there could be. But coal should be, you know, it's a balanced portfolio. You need to maintain affordable e electricity for, for everybody. So to do that, you're going to have gas, nuclear, coal, you're going to have renewables. And, of course, I think you can def definitely scale back, but you should not give up on coal yet. I mean, you could maybe find ways of using coal, gasifying it and having clean coal. Um, so really, to, I say the CERC effort is, is, is a good start. And, and they have clear goals. Um, there was also a comprehensive governance structure um, and also very detailed plans that were managed well. Um, so it's a promising indication that China and the US can move forward in collaboration. Um, but I say there's a lot more work to be done. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think you also refl uh, what you just talked also reflect a lot of barriers we mentioned in the previous discussion. I think with that, we also would like to welcome the voice from the academia. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab Laboratory and uh, from China Energy Group. So yesterday, uh, when I was having dinner with Dr. Zhou Dadi, he mentioned that uh, maybe he should be the one who's speaking. Oh. And uh, I should be the one who's speaking. He should be commenting. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, so before I came to this conference, I thought uh, I probably don't have much to offer because our group focused on energy demand, energy efficiency, not much on energy supply or coal issues. Um, but uh, having uh, heard many of our speakers and uh, commentator expert and to talk about uh, coal supply issues and some of the opportunities at the same time, the challenges in collaborating in um, coal supply. And we heard um, possible conflict in energy security or trade dispute, and, or in terms of technology, we all know some, a lot of the new Chinese coal plants, they're a lot more efficient than U.S. Um, plant, coal planting in the U.S. But I think uh, now maybe it's time to gear, uh, kind of change the gear a little bit and to talk about the potential on collaborating in reducing the coal demand. I think there's a great potential and a lot of opportunities in um, the demand, on the demand side, for U.S. and China to work together and to possibly maybe reduce the coal sum consumption by half. And in that year, I can give many examples and in the past and how we successfully collaborated. And then I'll, I can talk a little bit and some of the new innovative framework we can use for future collaboration. So because I started talking about energy demand, and I need to mention um, that China's uh, coal consumption, as many experts uh, also um, talked about, probably will peak and maybe before 2020. And China's coal mostly used the industry sector, which is very unique and special in comparison to many other developed countries. And so a lot of focus and has been in the industry sector, how to reduce and the demand there and improve the efficiency. However, also half of the coal used in industry, they're used for coking and for feedstock, and for which we have very limited option to reduce. And going forward, we do see um, the potential and could come from building sector and the transportation sector. And because energy demand in those sector will continue to grow and they use a lot of electricity and electricity most generated from coal. So if you can reduce the demand in those sectors and actually we have a lot of potential to reduce overall coal consumption and energy consumption. Uh, so in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, we see a lot of successful collaborations. Our group is one of the example. 
the existence of our group and the sustainability of uh, our group provided a sort of collaborative model. So our group uh, has been around for 25 years. We have our 25 year anniversary this year. And I want to mention uh, Dr. Joe Dadi actually uh, is one of the uh, people who actually helped initiate our group together with our group leader, um, Dr. Mark Levine, and back in 1988. And when DOE delegation visited China and asked whether there would be opportunity for collaboration, um, Chinese officials and experts, including Dr. Zhou Dadi, mentioned energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is exactly the area U.S. has a lot of experience and knowledge to offer, and China was in need and for capacity building. So that uh, was the original purpose for um, establishing our group. And Dr. Yang Fuqiang, many of you already heard, and his talk this morning was also um, a one of our group members for many years. And so for, for the many years we worked in um, building sector, appliance uh, efficiency, and uh, industry sector, and also in policy analysis modeling together with our Chinese counterpart. And the collaboration model include bringing the Chinese uh, scholars to our lab to provide the training in the use of the tools or methodologies used here to support policies and in the U.S. For example, the Energy Star um, initiated and um, implemented by U.S. EPA, and also standard, uh, a lot of the standard development for appliances, basically managed by uh, Department of Energy. And also in the building code, uh, in terms of developing a more efficient building code for China, we introduced the tool we developed here in um, DOE 2 tool, and which is also a DOE tool. We introduced that tool for our Chinese uh, collaborators and they use it to develop their building codes. And we're just one of the examples of um, the collaboration um, between the researchers, academias, and others, including WRI. I see many colleagues here, and NRDC, and together is a lot of other uh, organizations, and they all have uh, many projects in, uh, in China and have a lot of collaboration. So I do not see barriers or concerns or issues in terms of collaboration between the two countries and among the academias or research institutions. So, but I, I do want to mention, we, we see some, a um, uh, little bit of barrier or concerns when it comes to the uh, collaboration between the two governments. Dr. Uh, Zhou Dadi just mentioned that there are hundreds of MOU signed and uh, act, the new initiatives launched and all these new programs, but the very limited impact and the very limited effect. And that's because of the many reasons um, both Casey and uh, Dr. Uh, Joe also mentioned. And however, I do want to offer and introduce this very new pioneering platform, which Casey and um, Michael also mentioned, is the US China Clean Energy Center. And which has three consortium. One is coal, one's a vehicle, another is um, building energy efficiency, which I am leading. Um, and so I want to introduce why this is a pioneering and could be potential sustainable platform for the future collaboration between the two countries. So what's new about this uh, CERC is first the two governments provide very strong support and committed and funding. And each country committed $5 million for each CERC. So altogether, that's $15 million for three centers. Um, but the, uh, half of the funding from the government and half uh, on the U.S. side, that's from the Department of Energy. On the China side, it's from most Ministry of Science and Technology. And also at the same time, the other half is matched by our industry partners. I think Duke Energy is one of the industrial partners on the coal center. And in our building center, we have six uh, companies who are on our board, and they are contributing um, s uh, the equivalent amount of funding and to our research and development. So it started with $2.5 million two years ago. In the last two years, they have increased the contribution to $4 million a year, and which almost doubled the initial uh, pledge. 
So we see that、uh, increasing interest from our industry partners. That's probably because they see benefit and for them to be a part of the program. And also, our researchers are collaborating. Many of them for the first time in building sector.、Uh, we're working on six areas, and the re-、uh, researchers in the U.S. and working very closely with our Chinese researchers. And they have、um, biweekly video conferences, phone calls. They have visits, and they started from scratch. Didn't know each other because of this framework、uh, program brought them together. And then now working together, developing technologies and applying it, demonstrating in China, and eventually try to commercialize those technologies and then maybe use it for both U.S. and Chinese market. So we see、um, the Zerk platform provide a、um, very good channel for the governments to talk to each other, establish very good relationship, and going forward. And we see that the business businesses on both sides. And the U.S. side and Chinese side, and they are because they are included in the program. They will be talking to each other and figuring out the business opportunities. So we、we'll、see that happening, and it's also the strong collaboration between the researchers. And so it's a win-win-win situation, and、um, for governments, industries, and academia. So we really hope this、um, collaboration model and could be sustained and used for any other. Uh, future uh, collaboration in research development and in even policy、um, analysis area going forward between the two countries.、Um, with, with that, I think we'll leave more time for、um, questions and、uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junan. And I think、um, before I open the floor to the. Audience, I will possibly take the privilege as the moderator to raise two questions very briefly、um, to our two speakers. The first one would be to Casey.、Um, as you mentioned, a lot of the barriers、uh, that exist in between the business collaborations between U.S. China.、Um, I was very curious about, for example, the size of the companies in the coal sectors. We all know that China has some of the largest, world largest.、Uh, Coal companies in the world, whereas the U.S. counterparts may not be as big. So when they talk to each other, do you think the kind of like develop difference in their size and and pot- potentially their influence would become a, a, a good incentives for collaboration or actually a barrier? So let me. Um, uh, I'll give two examples where the differences in the U.S. and China system can、uh, be an issue. So, if、uh, a lot of the energy development in the U.S. is done by small to medium-sized companies, the coal mining sector,、um, with shale gas particularly, you have very small, medium, small, medium companies doing that. So, when you,、um, when the two governments get together and they say, "Oh, yeah, we should be collaborating on these issues. This is great."、Um, when the U.S. government goes and talks to small and medium companies in the U.S., they're not really.、Um, Ready to go and talk to、uh, China, you know. <laughs>、uh, frankly, they have they're a small company. They want to work in the U.S. They have a big market.、Um, they may have plans to grow in the U.S., but most of them are not thinking internationally. And if they're thinking internationally, they're thinking of something that's maybe a little bit easier in their minds, which would be you know Europe or somewhere where they you know. Uh, they don't need a lot of cultural background in order to survive. So there's there's a psychological barrier, I think, to many small to medium companies going into China.、Um, you know, a, a, a much larger company like GE, they go into China. They have a lot of staff resources. They have people who speak Chinese. They have people who are Chinese nationals to help them navigate.、Uh, they can hire consultants to figure out the bureaucracy. Small companies just don't have the resources to do that, so I, I think、um, that's an issue. I, I'll also bring up another slightly、um, different issue, just from the U.S.、Uh, Perspective is I worked on methane to markets、uh, at EPA for several years, and one of the things I saw there,、um, and my own observation is when you go to a very large coal mine in China,、uh, they're very focused, obviously, on mining coal. So when you go and you want to talk to them about、um, developing gas from coal mines、uh, through the gas coming in through the seams. 
they are really not that interested. You know, their performance and their uh, is based on how much coal they mine. In the U.S., it's a slightly different model. You have very small companies, and again, they don't want to deal with natural gas. They're coal miners. They're going to mine coal. But you have uh, gas companies, small gas companies, who are willing to develop for mutually beneficial terms. We don't see that model in China. Um, again, it's been a while since I've worked on these kind of issues, so that may have changed slightly. But uh, the structure in the U.S. lends itself a little bit more to de co-developing gas and coal than uh, in these large state-owned enterprises. So I think you know the regulatory structure is also affected by the size of the the mining, um, and so I think you get different outcomes. Now that's not to say China and the U.S. shouldn't compare notes and talk about what's what's good, what's working, what's not working, what the environmental issues are. But you have to, when you structure those discussions, you have to be aware of the dynamics so that you know you're not kind of talking at cross purposes in these discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the second question then is to uh, Dr. Zhou Dadi and also to our other colleagues here. Um, when we talk about the coal exports from U.S. to China, we were actually having very good intentions that this may be able to help China to replace in some of the uh, dirty domestic coal minings and uh, improving their records of the emissions. But how on earth we can actually make sure that this is only replacing the domestic coal mining, not actually pushing out and squeeze the market for the clean energy that developing in China. Uh, I, I, I think I have mentioned that just a, a little bit, but uh, uh, you know, China now import about uh, near 300 million tons in the last year uh, for the coal uh, importing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it becomes uh, really a market for the Chinese coal market. But uh, what happened is because of two issues. Yes, uh, because uh, at the last decades, the coal increases so quickly, so transportation facility is always behind. So sometimes uh, the, the, the transportation facility is not enough and uh, the cost becomes high. So that makes uh, the in the southeast parts uh, the coal price is uh, uh, twenty even twenty five percent more than that in the north part. So the international coal becomes um, competitive. So uh, and it uh, help to to smooth some kinds of shortage of the transportation and the supply. Uh, but yes, the background is uh, the coal increase uh, rate is very high. So each year we need uh, additional 200 million tons of the additional coal. So it, it happens very easily. Uh, and from the policy point of view, that China already uh, have a policy not declared, but uh, it becomes a consensus that uh, we were encouraged to import some kinds of uh, energy resources to help to uh, you know the, to, to, to release the pressure on the domestic production of the of the of the resources so uh, it matched uh, with the demand uh, but if the demand changed I think the situation especially for the competitive of the foreign coal uh, will be changed it really depends uh, if in the future the import coal price can be uh, continuously lower than the domestic supply, if the domestic supply capacity is in surplus. So that is a big risk so for these issues. But if the, the competition for the price becomes really serious, then the international coal price will, will, went down, <laughs> will, will go down. Then it could be a bad news for the renewables, <laughs> more or less. Thank you. And Dr. Chen, do you have anything to add on that? No. Okay. okay. Um, with that, we will open the floor to uh, the audience, and I think the same principle that Kevin stated in the morning still applied. So please wait for your microphone and uh, introduce yourself first. And uh, ideally, please just ask one concrete question rather than general ones. And this gentleman. Okay, uh, actually, I have introduced myself this morning. I'm you got more time than we will. 
Yeah, I have a question to Dr. Zhou Dadi. You are a very popular energy expert in China. Uh, you know DOE well, of course. You know NEA and NDRC better. So my question is that, what, uh, what uh, could we learn from uh, United Administration, uh, and uh, what uh, we can share uh, with our uh, United uh, American friends uh, on energy issues? especially on coal issues. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to consider another one night to answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the system of the both sides is not really the same. Uh, in China, the Energy Bureau, to some extent, is in charge of to 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 handle the developments and operation to some extent of the energy sectors more or less to improve to approve all the projects uh, to keep the market balance and uh, to handle the investment and not only regulatory issues mm -hmm. so it's uh, the job is not the same i think the, in this case uh, uh, you know, China is learning how to develop the so-called socialist uh, market system. Uh, we still have a lot of things to learn how the market operated in different situations. Uh, yes, it cannot be simply copied. But uh, at least I think the, you know, a Chinese Energy Bureau weighs only about 150 people. Uh, and the DOE has uh, 100, uh, 150, 100 people. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's quite different. So I say, uh, 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 any, uh, you, know, you, you know, Energy Information Agency, right? Mm -hmm. Under the DOE, you have uh, the same size, even more than the total uh, China's Energy Bureau administration. <laughs> So the information collection and the preparation and uh, it's quite good. I learned that from the from the, the website. I, I really appreciate that. But uh, the Chinese bureau want to do that, but uh, they have only two people to take out that. So it's very difficult. So that's uh, something you have to think about: uh, how the government to be organized. It's not as as only uh, energy sector issues. It's uh, totally. Uh, what's the government function in different kinds of markets with different entities, players in the market? So it's a big cha challenge and a big questions. So I think we, we, we will learn uh, still. Thank you. I think this round we will take a few questions altogether. And the gentleman in the middle. And this. Uh, Zhongxiang, Fudan University, China. I have one small question to Kansi Wang. Small question to Director, Director General Zhou. Uh, small uh, question is, you know, I'm very impressed by Director General Zhou said there were 200 agreements between the two countries. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm not that surprised that they don't achieve much uh, if you know, only look at the directly the result. Mm -hmm. So I would say that probably it's better to really look at this kind of agreement, what, what the result achieved directly and what is indirectly by improved the know-how also. And also look at, you know, is a kind of leverage to find opportunities. Because you said you work in the EPN. I remember a few years ago there was a man thing. Was a, there was a coal mine in the Da Tong in Sanxi. And they finally found that opportunity. Then was a U.S. put some money, but mostly from ADB. Finally, they actually created, you know. So that's things I said maybe. You know, they have the group here, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory China Group. They are very good at this bottom line analysis. Maybe you, you know, use the American money to do this kind of policy analysis to see what kind of thing can improve and so on. So that's my uh, uh, question to the uh, Director Zhou is, uh, you know, a few years ago, I added a special issue of general policy modeling. I get one contribution from MIT, Jacobi, a Daniel Elman group, to look at the rule of coal in the U.S., Basically, that study says that, uh, you know, given a certain price of coal, a certain price of carbon, and there's no worry about the coal. U.S. still can use the coal 
for after years and still can meet the Kyoto and all this kind of whatever uh, climate agreement. But my point is, uh, you know, for China, anyhow, they could probably still use for quite a while and uh, given the national uh, endowment. So my point is, did, we, did you and your institution or maybe China have did some study, is there any kind of capacity in terms of storage and what kind of price, which is, you know, that China don't have to worry about the use of coal as far as the CCS technology become commercialized? Okay, and we take another questions here. Yes. Dan Mara, George Washington University. Um, everybody agrees that the development of CCS is critically important. Mm -hmm. And you could imagine two, in simple terms, pathways to get to commercial scale CCS. One is public financed RD and D, and the other would be private companies, a consortium of private companies, developing the technology, patenting it, and selling it. Which pathway do you think is most likely? <laughs> Okay, thank you. And the last question, I think, either is an. Okay, so the third one. Hi, my name is Erica with the Center for Clean Air Policy, and my question is for um, Dr. Joe Dadi and Dr. Del Hotel. I'm just wondering, as China ramps up their cap and trade pilots, um, do you anticipate, or are there existing discussions in, you know, if not national but regional exchanges between the two countries in carbon trade? Okay, thank you. So now. Can we have the answers from our speakers? Do you want me to go first? Okay. Uh, so on the MOUs, uh, yeah, the the U.S. government realized there's a proliferation of, <laughs> of pieces of paper, frankly, that uh, don't have a lot of commitment. Um, and there's a there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, part of that is. Uh, DOE is a very large organization. We have a lab structure of roughly 18, 19 labs under us. They all do their own MOUs with China. In addition to that, DOE actually has six major counterparts as well as several other uh, institutes that we work with. And so when you work on something like energy efficiency in buildings, we end up going to each ministry separately and doing an MOU. Um, now, not all of that paper is, you know, only worth the paper it's written on, um, there are specific initiatives that either um, are renewed or get, you know, funded year after year. And so we try and actually graduate out as many of the MOUs as we can. Um, we see, uh, in, in some ways, I think early on, there was a lot of trial and error. We did an MOU. We started work. If things didn't quite work out the way we wanted, we backed off of that and tried something mm -hmm. different. Um, I think we're now at a point where we really know what issues we can work on and where we should be. And um, and I, I think our Chinese counterparts would agree with that. And so we're trying to focus on the few key initiatives. Um, and for us, uh, it's the 10-year framework and the Clean Energy Research Center in particular. There's a couple of other industry forums that we're, um, we will continue. We find them very useful, like the oil and gas industry forum, the renewable energy industry forum. But other, you know, and there's a lot of nuclear, and I'm, you know, I won't even go into all the nuclear nonproliferation stuff. But I think we are trying to focus our efforts on key MOUs and basically cut, you know, cut ties and, and move on from MOUs that aren't producing results. Um, it's, um, I would love to do a study and, and do a very scientific look at it, uh, with interagency politics on both sides, it's much harder to do that. Um, uh, do you want me to go ahead and answer or respond? To, Up to you, which questions you want to answer. Um, I can also, uh, on the private and public, I'll give sort of the U.S. answer to that. Uh, on CCS, we think it has to be both. Um, demonstration projects of carbon capture, utilization, and storage are, you know, in the billions of dollars. So DOE domestically is uh, providing grant money from between $300 million to $500 million to about six projects in the U.S. that's demonstrating carbon capture and utilization. Uh, we're, use, we're using it actually for enhanced oil recovery in Texas in particular. There's some other across the U.S., uh, we are as actually working with Chinese oil companies to participate in those projects. In some cases, uh, they would provide some of the contracting and financing. 
for um, actually the generation of the electricity. So there, you know, there is a lot of ways that we're combining the two funding resources to do this. Um, the CERC is also another example where we have um, the U.S. government, the Chinese government, and Chinese and U.S. private sector uh, companies doing joint research. I, I think if you really want to accelerate this technology and get it the cost down to where it's actually you know, usable by the, co the companies, you're going to have to put as much as you can resource-wise towards these, these problems. Um, and then the, on the regional exchanges, uh, I think some of the uh, regions in the U.S., uh, Northeast and California come to mind, are looking at doing some cooperation with China. I don't, I don't actually know where those discussions are. So DOE, um, frankly, we're more of an R&D organization, and we ha have very few regulatory responsibilities. Cap and trade is not really in our bailiwick. So um, uh, we do try and provide technical assistance to EPA and the regions in terms of um, technology suggestions, help through our labs, that kind of thing. But uh, we haven't really been involved in the cap and trade discussions. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Do you? Uh, the, in terms of time, I think that for the, the uh, Dr. John's Professor John's question is that uh, if there is su such kinds of carbon price or carbon tax to to make the coal be used, but uh, be limited as well, so. I, I don't think it's true because uh, even for the U.S., uh, there's not only price issues. It's, uh, there's the EPA standards that uh, each of the, the kilowatt hours uh, electricity can emit only uh, 350 gram of the carbon. That means only the gas combined cycle can meet mm -hmm. that standard. Coal is in, we have no such a Technology, so it's uh, this kinds of standards will really kick out the coal in the new built uh, power plants. So it's a standards issues. It's not the cost. Uh, so, but of course, uh, in the model, the cost will be very efficient. But uh, in the practice, I think the uh, price of the tax could be one of the measures. But uh, uh, if you think about the, if you can continue to raise the tax it will face a very difficult political pose because you cannot use it as once. Uh, then later on, the, all, the, all the things fixed based on that, that's a tax. Then the consumer resumed. So then you have to raise the tax again. So it's a continuous strike with the political process. So we need both of the price, uh, incentives, uh, tax, or something like that. And the standards, uh, and the regulations, and the thresholds for the for the license, something like that. Uh, second is the carbon trade. Is uh, from the IPCC point of view, carbon trade uh, at the beginning is uh, to try to help to achieve the so-called least cost measures conclusion for some kinds of targets. If you want to cut down the emission, uh, you need a CAP system first to be established to allocate the quota, but the quota cannot be really fairly precisely to be allocated for the, each of the users. So you, you give them the room for trade if the cost is higher than others. But uh, practically, uh, the trade cost could be very high. Mm -hmm. And how to check it, how to continuously to check it, <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenge. So uh, I think it's uh, some kinds of ma mechanism try, but uh, up to now it's not really a big solution. Yes, it could be a theoretically gives the people the the you know the 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 uh, like a soft curtain if they fall on down. <laughs> Thank you. Michael and I will try, <laughs> and a lot of people yes. Uh, with a lot of um, expectation for the uh, the trade system, but see, it helped to promote the, the 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 quota system be accepted first. So, that's thank the you. Situation. Anything to add from the discussion? Well, just just one thing. I think the um, carbon capture utilization storage issue is just really further emphasis of today. Problems are extremely complicated and. 
they need partnerships and collaboration to solve. And it's not just, um, you know, thinking of it in, in one dimension. It's, it's large companies, small companies. It's government organisations, non-government organisations, and now even, and, and academia, but even now extending that across the boundaries of countries. So I think that's just a good, good example. Um, so I want to re-emphasize again uh, the demand reduction for coal, particularly. And uh, it's undeniable that we need to collaborate on the technology de for development um, such as CCUS and together other tech with other technologies. Um, but when we look at the China's energy demand and mission future all the way until 2050 and then look at the low carbon pathways and the compare different policy measure technology that could be used and then look at the significance and impact on the demand reduction, what we found is that uh, when we use CCS, it also adds um, some energy and the CO2 because you're running an, um, in the technology in this uh, utilizing and comprising and transporting all these processes, you use a lot of energy. Uh, what we found is about uh, the energy penalty is about 40%. You increase 40% of energy. With the new advanced technology, I heard it's still 25%. And so when we look at uh, uh, China's energy mix today, and the electricity generation mostly is still from coal. So if we use a coal generated electricity to run CCUS, and actually we're not reducing much CO2, we're adding more CO2. Only when the power sector is decarbonized more with more renewable and the nuclear, and then we, with the additional uh, energy use, and overall it can uh, achieve some CO2 reduction. And then when we compare the contribution from CCS with demand reduction or energy efficiency measures, and they're not in the same magnitude. And there's a lot larger potential in improving efficiency in all the end use sectors and also large potential in reducing our demand, such as our human, uh, our behavior, uh, like whether we want to have more cooling or heating, more lighting and such um, behavior change. And if we have policies to um, help people and to react into those uh, energy reduction and to have all the technologies, buildings, vehicles to be um, designed and built more efficiently. And uh, we have a lot less uh, re dependence on the fossil fuel. Thank you. I think we also have another, about 10 minutes for another round of questions. No? Seems we solved the issues very well. <laughs> And coffee, Bert? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, please join me to um, thanks for the ex excellent panel discussion that we solved all the issues.